Good evening, everyone. My name is Jenny V. Jolson. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Planning Commission meeting. And we will, I'll get started with the first announcement. Translation services are available off to the left if you are interested and need that. Um, otherwise, we will get started. Um, so will you please take a roll call for attendance? Acosta? Hammer? Here. Rodriguez? Sarmiento? Here. Tavares? Jones? Here. Beach Olson? Here. And now I'd like to ask uh, Vice Chair Jones to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Y'all please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Now is the time for presentation and oral communications from the public and the planning commission. So this is the time that's set aside for any members of the public to address the planning commission on any item that is not on the agenda, with is, which is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the planning commission. So if you have something that you would like to share with us, please come up to the podium, give us your name and uh, your announcement. Upon seeing none, I think we will move forward to um, any oral communications from the planning commissioners. Okay, Commissioner Kovner. There are a lot of events going on in July, so I'm sure that we'll hear about those um, from you, Nick. Uh, but I also wanted to remind people that on August 6th, Tuesday, August 6th, is National Night Out. So um, looking forward to the next month. Uh, National Night Out is for um, where neighborhoods participate in various activities, barbecues, kids' games, um, just neighborhood get-togethers to send a message to the community that they're not going to tolerate any um, negative activity in their neighborhood and to it's also a way to help the officers in the community out to for um, looking out for different um, negative activities that might happen in, in the city. So looking forward to that. Thank you. I'd like to wish you all a happy 4th of July. The Spirit of Watsonville fireworks show is tomorrow night out at the airport, and then the 4th of July parade is at noon on Thursday, and please have a safe and lovely holiday, and don't forget to take care of your pets in whatever way is necessary. All right, let's move on to a presentation by the Parks Director on the Parks and Recreation Strategic and Master Plan for Ramsey Park and the City Plaza. This is going to be a good one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. Good evening. My name is Nick Kalubakib, and I'm the Parks and Community Services Director for the City of Watsonville. Um, thank you all for having me here this evening. Um, since Commissioner Cameron gave me the, uh, the, the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of our events, I'm going to do that real quickly here first. Um, I think Commissioner um, uh, Veach Olson mentioned, you know, of course, we have Fire in the Sky tomorrow night and our parade on, on the 4th. Um, every Wednesday throughout the month of July from um, 11.30 to 1.30 also, we're having what we're calling recess at the plaza. We have um, a whole bunch of brand new oversized games that we're pulling out at lunchtime every Wednesday, um, again from 11.30 to 1.30 in, in the plaza downtown. Um, so please join us for that. Um, every Friday also, and half, a half hour before sunset at Callahan Park, we're doing movies in the park. And so um, bring out your blankets and your lawn chairs and join us for that. This Friday, we're showing um, the second Lego movie, and so it should be a ton of fun. Again, that's a half hour before sunset every Friday um, throughout the month. Our um, summer uh, Music in the Plaza series also kicked off last month, and two Thursdays this month. Um, I apologize, I don't have those dates off, offhand here, but it's all on our website. But two, two of the Thursdays um, this month, we have music in, in the Plaza, again, on Thursday evening at about 6.30. So um, again, come, come join us for that as well. Um, 
What else here? Um, of course, everybody knows our Strawberry Festival is right around the corner on, on August 3rd and 4th, and uh, we have two brand new events that we're, that we're kicking off the festival with this year as well in celebration of the festival's 25th anniversary. On Friday night, August 2nd, um, at 6.30, we have our, our festival kickoff party that's going to be in, in the Beer Garden, or um, otherwise known as, as Romo Park, or, the, or formerly known as Romo Park, um, right across the street from the plaza. Um, we'll have um, craft beers, food trucks, music and entertainment, and it should be a ton of fun and a great way to celebrate with the whole family to kick off the festival. Our, our, our carnival also kicks off that evening as well, and um, we'll have reduced rate tickets that night at the same time. The following morning on Saturday, um, August 3rd, um, starting at 8 a.m., we have our first annual Strawberry Jam Fun Run that is, is being put on by our friends of Parks and Community Services. Um, it's a 5K fun run along with a 1K kids run as well. Um, you can register for that event on active.com and just search for Strawberry Jam Fun Run. So lots of, lots of um, really fun and exciting things happening. Um, July is Parks and Recreation Month, and so we have a whole bunch of activities planned for basically every single day throughout the month of July. So check out our website for more information. I believe um, the commission has handouts as well um, sitting in front of them. So um, please come and join us. <clears throat> so on to the topic um, that I'm really here for tonight. Um, here to, to give um, as brief a, r a report as possible on our um, strategic planning uh, process along with the master plans that we're working on developing um, for both the City Plaza and for Ramsey Park um, that we are, are working on in, in partnership with Verde Design Incorporated, which is a, a landscape architecture and civil engineering firm. So um, the objectives of my report tonight is really just to provide the commission with an understanding of um, our existing conditions and current use of both the, the plaza and Ramsey Park, and to provide a summary of community engagement efforts and input that we've received on our master plans so far, um, and, and really to kind of give the commission an overview of where we are in the process of, of developing these plans as well. So we are working on three projects simultaneously. I'm going to talk about the first two this evening. Um, so we're working on master plans for both the City Plaza and Ramsey Park, as I mentioned. Simultaneously, we're working on developing an overall strategic plan for parks and recreation services in the community in general. Um, but that, that project is running on a slightly different timeline now, and we plan to bring that back to the um, Parks and Recreation Commission and the Council for adoption in September. Um, so why are we going through, th through these efforts in the first place? Um, it, it's really an effort to engage the community to, to develop kind of long-term strategic direction for um, parks and recreation services in general, whether that be development, expansion, or rehabilitation of all of our programs, um, facilities, and, and services. Um, the, the second kind of underlying reason for, for going about this um, now is, is really to be able to position our, our places and spaces um, to be eligible for what, what um, folks in the field are calling kind of once-in-a-lifetime state grant opportunities through Proposition 68. <laughs> um, Prop 68, if, if, if um, everyone will recall, was, was um, adopted or, or, or passed by the voters in California back in June of 2018. And um, it, it's basically a, a state bond act for um, park and water projects that sets aside about $4 billion for, for those types of projects. Um, so about $2 billion of, of that four is, is available for park-related projects. And um, really, in order to be able to be eligible for, for that funding, um, we have to have our, our, our proposed projects um, up to a certain level of design um, in order to, to, to put those forth. So that's what really what we're trying to accomplish in terms of creating these master plans for both the plaza and, and Ramsey. So why master plans and really what are master plans? Um, they're, they're, they're kind of overall um, forward-thinking visions for, for specific park sites. Um, they're typically um, established through community-driven visions for these, for these significant assets, and, and that's really something that we've tried to do throughout this process is to make sure that everything that, that, that we've put together and, and put forth so far is, is really driven by conversations that we've had with the community. Um, they're, they're designs that are put forth with, with kind of thinking of the entire park space in mind. Um, one of the things that tends to happen without kind of this overall master plan for a space is that pieces or components of, of a park will get built as opportunities arise. And when that happens, um, oftentimes um, amenities are, are, are put in locations within a park space. Um, and then, you know, several, several years down the road, another opportunity comes up and, and, and you, you know, we look back and we're like, oh, you know, why, would, why did we put that bathroom there when that could be really used as a better space for, you know, the new skate park or, or whatever that might be. Um, so, so it allows us to kind of look at the whole space all together and think about all the amenities that we want to see in that space um, in its entirety. 
And then again, like I mentioned, it helps to position the city for um, funding opportunities. Um, but really, the, the overall reason and driving force behind all of these master plans is, is to reimagine how our existing uses of these spaces can intertwine with history um, and, and create a kind of an updated modern perspective for, for both of those, those spaces. Um, so here's what our schedule has looked like. Um, we started the, the planning process really back in, in, in January and then kicked off our, our community meetings in February. Um, we met with a, a large stakeholder group, um, individuals that represented or, um, nonprofit organizations and youth serving organizations and, and um, ba basically you know, as, as many organizations as, as we could kind of gather together that in some way, shape or form kind of touch um, what we do in terms of Parks and Rec. And then we had a whole series of, of community workshops and meetings um, where we touched on all three projects. And then we kind of drilled down and had um, uh, project specific workshops on both the plaza and Ramsey. We held several um, pop-up meetings, both at Ramsey Park and at, at the city plaza, um, in addition to another stakeholder meeting. Um, and what's not listed on here too is, is we, we were at several farmers markets um, throughout that time period as well and, and, and had quite a few kind of drop-in interview type meetings where we just met with people who were sitting in the plaza and, and other spaces as well just to get other feedback. Um, we also had a, a survey that I'll talk a little bit about in, in, in a little bit as well. So now we're at the stage where, where we've um, put together draft um, conceptual plans or, or master plans for, for both spaces. We were with our Parks and Recreation Commission tonight. Um, obviously, we're, we're, we're here this evening and then plan to take these drafts to the council for consideration and feedback uh, for general direction um, next Tuesday on the 9th. Um, we plan to be back in front of the Parks and Recreation Commission with, with final draft plans at the beginning of August and then um, take those to city council on the 27th of August after that. Um, so here's, here's kind of a, a synopsis of, of some of the attendance that we've had, at least at some of our meetings. Um, you can see that some of our meetings were, were, were pretty well attended, especially for, for these type of, of, of public input meetings. Um, there, there are several where we had 20 plus people or 30 plus people, um, even into the 40s on some occasions. Um, our online survey responses are, are there as well. Our, our, our survey is still um, open for, for responses and feedback as well. And I have some flyers here that I can pass out to try to encourage more individuals to to complete that survey. Um, there's, there's a list of other engagement efforts that, that I spoke a little bit about earlier um, as well. Let's sit at the bottom of the slide here. So jumping right into things, um, uh, we're gonna talk first about the city plaza. Um, as most of us, I, I think in, in the room know, um, the, the, the city plaza has, has a rich historical um, um, history full of um, you know, different specific landmarks and designations and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, stretching back to the, the 1860s when um, Don Sebastian Rodriguez, um, who owned the land formerly, um, deeded the land to the, to the town of Watsonville. Um, and uh, later on, I mean, m many years later, about a, you know, 100 years later, um, the, the plaza was added to the National Registry of Historic Places. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about some of the historic features within the plaza. Um, we, we have the bandstand, which was constructed in, in, in 1980 originally. Um, and as, as you can see in the picture in the upper right-hand corner, it was originally established as, as a bandstand. It was kind of a square structure that was placed um, kind of on the main street side of the plaza. Um, and then in 1906 was when um, our kind of current iteration of, of the existing gazebo was, was built. Um, it was built with, without a roof originally, and then there was a roof that was added in 1916. Um, with, a, with a second remodeled roof built in 1967. And um, since the 89 Loma Prieta earthquake has been closed to public use due, due to, to seismic damage. Our fountain uh, was built in 1980 and then uh, relocated slightly in, in um, 1893. Um, it, it's been remodeled and refurbished several times over. Um, and, and today, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's kind of hit or miss in terms of functionality. Um, there's some issues with the pump along with a lot of the, the tile work and whatnot that needs to be addressed as well. Um, we have our drinking fountain that was donated in 1893 by the Women's Christian um, Temperance Union, um, still in its original location. Um, and then there is a, 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 a functioning drinking fountain that was added uh, by the city years later that you can see in the picture here. Our cannons um, also have, have um, a, a, a rich history as well. I think, I think Susie can tell us about all these different things <laughs> way better than I can. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of flying through this as, as, as quickly as possible just, just in respect of time. 
Um, but you can see here that, that, that old Betsy um, was one of the first cannons that, or what, was one of the cannons that was used to announce California becoming um, a, a state of, of the Union. Um, so, so you can see from, from these pictures here, a lot of our, our, our features in the plaza need a little bit of, of TLC and, and love and care. Um, you know, from looking at the gazebo there, besides the, the seismic damage, there's a lot of kind of, um, kind of facelift um, issues that, that need to be addressed with the gazebo to kind of make it look um, as, as beautiful as it, as, as it originally was. Um, same with the fountain, we talked a little bit about that with the, with the pump and some of the tile work that, that needs to be addressed. Um, in terms of seating, um, you know, there, there is some seating in the, in, in the plaza that, that I think we all know is used um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, one of the things that, that, we, that we've heard through our conversations with community members is that there, there could be additional seating throughout, and we'll, we'll kind of get into that in a little bit as well. Um, in terms of paving, um, so some of the pavements kind of in and around the plaza is in better condition than, than others, and there is kind of the, this, this thematic brick um, kind of outlay that you'll see here throughout the plaza that um, you know, may be something that we can do more with um, down, the, down the road here. In terms of our plantings, um, I mentioned that there are, there are a number of historical trees within the plaza. There's a lot of kind of old, um, you know, kind of quote unquote old, old growth trees that, that are there as well um, that, that I think, you know, add a lot of great aesthetic to, to the plaza. In terms of, of some of the, the, the kind of low-lying landscaping and whatnot, there, there is, uh, I think, some opportunities to kind of make things look a, a little bit more thematic and, and, and match throughout the, uh, the overall um, space. And then, of course, there's our, our beautiful bathroom. <laughs> uh, so in terms of, of current use, um, you know, I, I think I and I think many people in our community really think of the plaza as kind of being our community's heart. Um, it's it's the, the home and location of, of um, you know, 20 plus special events annually, including the Strawberry Festival and, and weekly is, is, the, is the place where we host our, our farmer's market. Um, so as, as we kind of went through the series of meetings that we had and, and talked to people through surveys and social media and so on and so forth, these, these are some of the priorities that kind of rose to the top in terms of, of um, things, things to kind of take a look at in the plaza. Um, so uh, first and foremost, the historical gazebo needs some, re some rehabilitation. Um, there's a need for more seating areas. Um, the plaza needs a, a permanent restroom other than, than, than the, uh, the, the porta potty that we have there. Um, there's, there's, there's a thought that, that a play area might encourage um, uh, the, the use by families in the plaza. Um, there's uh, key city theme and art features, so, so there could be an opportunity to, to kind of, again, kind of tie an overall theme w within the plaza together using landscaping, using art features, and so on and so forth. Um, there was a, a, a stated need for a staging area and um, s seating area for concerts and small plays and, and, and things, that, things like our, our movie nights in the plaza and so on and so forth. The fountain um, needs some rehabilitation. There, there's a, a need for, for additional lighting and upgrading um, in terms of, of, of lighting and uh, making sure that those materials that are used for lighting are, are consistent throughout. Um, trees and landscape could be rehabilitated. Um, again, kind of uh, along the lines of, of, of consistent theme and, and design. Um, the sidewalks could continue to, to use specialty materials like the, like the brick um, um, inlays that, that we talked about. And um, of course, we want to make sure that, that we're coordinating um, anything that we, that we do moving forward with community development to ensure that there's consistency with the future downtown specific plan. So our, our consultants, um, you know, kind of after thinking about th those priorities, developed a couple different concepts for the community to, to take a look at. Um, so this here is, is concept one um, from up above. What you'll see here um, are a, a few different things that I'll kind of point out here that um, will be different from the, the other concepts that I'll show you this evening. Um, so, so right in the middle here, of course, is our, is our, our gazebo or, or bandstand. Um, you'll see the fountain sitting right here, and all of our, our trees, for the most part, well, I mean, all, all of our big trees are, are kind, of, kind of sitting throughout. This, this doesn't get into kind of granular detail of like every single shrub and, and, all, and all of our historical trees and, and that sort of thing as of yet. This design is really meant to be kind of like our 30% like our design out, so it doesn't get into the weeds of, you know, exactly what type of bench we have or exactly where that tree will go or what color the pavers will be and that sort of thing. It's really meant to be kind of what features um, exist within a space and, and where are they really placed um, so, so that we can um, have kind of, kind of that overlay plan and, and you know, if and when we, we obtain funding for the project, then that's when we move forward with construction documents that, that kind of 
detail, um, those types of, of, of things. So again, the, the plaza's kind of here in the middle, or, or sorry, the gazebo's in the middle here. Um, this blue area here represents a stage that, that faces Main Street. Um, the seating that's proposed in this concept design is, is kind of a, a little grassy knoll, so, so it's raised slightly here, um, probably about 18 inches or so in, in the middle section here, so that individuals who are viewing whatever's happening on the stage here, whether it be a movie or um, you know, a concert or, or whatnot, or, or a dance group, um, can, can um, have better viewing of, of what's happening here. Um, these areas here represent uh, picnic tables and, and possibly kind of game tables. You know, if you kind of think about um, those like four top seating tables that have kind of inlaid checkerboards or, or, or chess boards, um, that's kind of the idea here. We have our permanent restroom in, in this corner right over here. Um, this, this yellow area here represents um, kind of somewhat of, of, of a play area. Um, because of, of, of the space and, the, and, and the, well, the amount of space that's in the plaza, I mean, this is definitely not something that looks like your typical park with, you know, slides and, and swing sets and that sort of thing. It's really kind of smaller type features that, that really could also tie into um, the rest of, 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 of the theme of the plaza as it, as it, as it kind of builds out. Um, you know, one of the things that we hear over and over again is that, um, you know, when I was little, the, the, the canyons in the plaza were, were, were the play feature, and that's what we climbed on. So, so kind of think along those type of lines, right? It's not, it's, it, it's not kind of, again, like your, your giant slide or your giant swing set. It's, it's more kind of something that, that's kind of an homage to history, an homage to art that also ties into um, to the plaza here. Um, we have kind of benches and, 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 and whatnot kind of built throughout here as well. And I think that's kind of the overview of, of concept one. I'll show you a couple more. Oh yeah, okay. So this is, uh, this is concept two. You can see that this is kind of a, a more drastic change from the plaza's existing design. Um, what this one does is, is it, it, it shifts the gazebo um, off towards Main Street to the location pretty much of, of where the original bandstand was when, when the plaza was, was first designed. Um, the stage area gets constructed right over here, kind of on the, on the, the east beach side of the plaza. Um, by shifting the gazebo here, it kind of opens up this middle area for a large number of things, whether it be um, kind of tent space, it could be um, a dance floor for what happens at the stage area here. Um, th there could be um, seats or, or chairs that are brought in here also for, for performances here as well. Um, this design also shows kind of a, a, a terrace style seating on the opposite end facing the stage. So this is kind of, um, this is Peck Street, um, just for orientation again. Um, so this, this terrace style seating is, is, is probably something that, that, that looks like, you know, about, you know, 12 feet, or sorry, 12 inches high for each kind of level up with um, either grass inlaid or, or synthetic turf inlaid in between. Um, to provide kind of a you know like like more or less like like st like terrace site seat, um, type seating for uh, for individuals who are watching performances here, um, you'll see here that the restroom um, is, is still in the same place here. Um, instead of having kind of grouped picnic or, or gathering spaces, it's kind of spread throughout a little bit more in this design. There's there's kind of one smaller area here with a little one kind of under the trees here. You'll see that in this design also the the um, the the the, the play area kind of get, gets, gets moved out, so there is no play area in, in this design. Um, so that's kind of another difference between um, concept one and concept two. Um, in terms of, of, of costs, what we're looking at for concept one is, is just about $3.4 million. Um, again, what the, what the plan is for both of the, for, for um, you know, any of these designs is really to kind of line us up um, to be eligible and, and competitive for those Prop 68 funds. Um, so just just want to be clear that, that you know we definitely do not have this money in the bank today. It's it's really just to make sure that we're um, positioned well to be able to be eligible for for funding. Um, one thing that I didn't mention that isn't in both of these concepts is um, if you take a look at at kind of the shading that's on Peck Street here and on Union here. Um, the idea here is 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 that you know because we close these these two streets in particular. Um, very frequently, I mean, you know, in most cases on a weekly basis for things like our farmer's market and our special events, the thought is to thematically tie those streets into the design of the rest of the plaza so that when those streets are closed um, and you step off that sidewalk, it really still feels like you are um, in, in, in the plaza itself. So, so, so what we're looking at is, is kind of um, inlaying pavers that match um, pavers that are, it, that are kind of throughout the rest of the plaza to, again, kind of create that overall look and feel 
Um, we're, we're, we're definitely not proposing to close this street permanently, um, but, but to set this up again as, as a means to, um, to be able to, to kind of incorporate it into the plaza when it, when it is closed. Um, concept two is, is, is um, slightly more expensive at about $3.5 million. And then what our cons um, consultants have also done is, is, is they've kind of taken the best of both worlds and, and taken kind of, kind of the feedback for features and locations of features that, that we've heard kind of the, the, the most positive feedback for and kind of blended those into one, um, one concept here in concept three. So what you'll see here is the gazebo kind of back in the middle here. Um, the stage is, is kind of facing Main Street with a little bit of a um, kind of an area for dance floor here. There's some, uh, our terraced seating um, is, is kind of sitting in this area here. There's some gathering spaces, um, picnic tables and whatnot right over here. The play feature kind of, kind of sits on this, on this side of the plaza again, um, along with uh, the permanent restroom kind of just moved over slightly on the other side of the pathway in, in this design. Um, and this, this design comes in at about uh, $3.3 million. <clears throat> Um, so here's just, just um, an overview of what we've heard from the folks that we've spoken to from the community regarding some of these, these key points. Um, in terms of the gazebo, um, you, know, you can see here that, that we've, we've heard that, uh, that the majority of people prefer that it remains in place in the center. Um, in terms of, of the stage seating, uh, we've heard more preference towards the terraced style seating. Um, in terms of having a play area or not a play area, um, it's about 60-40. Uh, the, the seating, whether or not there's there's tables kind of in in groups versus spread out, it's 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 been pretty split 50-50, um, but it seems like there's definitely um, a, kind of a good majority that that would like to see um, some repaving done to the, to uh, Peck and Union Streets to help tie those into the plaza. Um, so um, as we went to the, the Parks and Recreation C Commission last night, we we had them um, give us direction on on what they would like to see with all of these these elements. And we plan to do the same with, um, with the council next week. Um, so on to Ramsey Park here. Um, we have an urban greeting grant that we, that we received this year that um, is helping us to kind of build out, um, I, I know it's difficult to see the, the, the legend on this plan, but um, the, the, the red lines and the yellow lines um, delineate uh, existing trails and future trails that we're, that we're gonna be able to add into the park throughout. There's a number of, of dots also that, that show future trees that are being added to the park throughout, including the parking lot that's on the Main Street side, um, along with some, some other improvements. Um, so some of our existing conditions there, um, we've, we've got definitely some, some pavement issues. Um, the Family Center could use some, some, some help and love and upgrades as well. Um, we have some major issues with draining on our soccer field, um, which causes us, causes us to, to, to need to close that field um, for more months out of the year than, than we really desire. Our softball field um, could also need some love as well. It's got some drainage issues. Um, uh, we've been working on replacing some of these bleachers and, and, and redoing the dugouts and mod over, the, over this past year. So it's looking a little bit better, but there's still a long way to go um, in terms of, of the field. This is kind of our, our upper knoll of the park. Um, there's some work that needs to be done on the pathways. Um, we can, there's, I think, some opportunity to, to um, improve some of these these crew picnic picnic areas as well. The playground um, is is I think kind of severely out, out of date. Um, there's there's a lot of components that have kind of either broken or or are not re, not not in use currently. And um, I mean it's kind of so old that there's no we can't buy parts for it anymore. So that's kind of a high priority for us to to look at fixing and replacing. This is our old skate park um, on uh, kind of the Harkins Slough side of of, of the park. Um, so these are the, the priorities that have been identified through our conversations with the community, um, that, that there, there could be a dedicated indoor gym space um, built off of the family center. The family center could also use a classroom um, and have partitions for, for, um, that, that would kind of facilitate different uses. And the overall interior needs some refreshing um, and more storage as well. Um, the soccer field is too steep and, um, and the, the soccer pitch is smaller than desired, so, so the overall feel is kind of small, it lacks lights, um, it has some drainage issues, and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of kind of ADA access issues throughout the park as well, and um, including that the picnic areas are kind of far from other park amenities, such as the playground areas. Um, playground equipment we talked about. Um, 
and visibility up on, on top of the, the hill is not, is not super adequate. So here's our, our preferred concept. I'm gonna walk you through this real, real quickly here. Um, this is our, our existing family center right here. Um, this plan shows an additional indoor gymnasium that's kind of built um, right next to it. Um, I should point out, just taking a step backwards here, this black line here represents our 100-year our um, flood zone. So what we're trying to do also is kind of move um, as much as we can our amenities to the left of that black line um, to, to kind of secure our, whatever investments we, we make into this park. Um, this soccer field becomes, becomes larger and kind of pushes um, inward into the hill here um, using some, some retaining walls that can also be used to build in permanent seating for spectators in the field. Um, building that field outwards gives us two full adult size, size fields that can be played kind of this way, um, perpendicular to Main Street. Um, we have a second kind of larger field um, with our existing softball field, and what we're propo proposing is that this becomes a synthetic field that, that allows us to, to have multiple use out of it where we can play both softball, baseball, and, and soccer when it's not in use for, for baseball and softball. These blue areas here are our are, 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 are play areas. Um, it kind of brings them down the hill slightly so that it makes them a little bit more accessible for, for uh, children with disabilities, especially. We have kind of a tot lot here and a, a playground for, for older kids here. There's some um, group picnic areas kind of spread throughout this hillside as well. This um, large brown patch here um, becomes a dog park, so we have room for both a lar large dog park and a small dog park. Um, this area over here, over the old skate park, is, is a, a, a BMX pump track. Um, this building here with the purple roof is, is um, a permanent nature center. Um, you can see that we've moved that out of, uh, out of the flood plain, or out of the flood zone in its current location up, up on the hill here, um, right next to this large amphitheater, which, which could um, become kind of the outdoor classroom for the nature center as, as youth groups come through there. Um, those are really kind of the main things I wanted to point out here at Ramsey. Um, these are our overall kind of preliminary construction costs for each element and the total cost for, um, for, for the build out. With Ramsey, I mean, it, it's really gonna be kind of an opportunity-based um, uh, prioritization of how we kind of build these things out as, as we go, you know, through grants and, and other funding opportunities. Um, so again, these are, these are kind of the overall pieces of the park that we've looked at. I think we've kind of talked through these, so I won't go over those again. Um, so again, just just quick recap here. Um, we'll be back in front of the Parks and Rec Commission in, on August 5th and then back in front of the, the council on August 27th. Um, next week again, we'll be, we'll be with the city council conducting a study session to um, gather uh, overall direction for where the council would like us to, to take these plans into the final draft. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Go for it, Commissioner Sarmiento. Thank you. Wow, it sounds pretty exciting. <laughs> Very. <laughs> I wish it could happen immediately <laughs> or within a year. Um, so at Ramsey Park, when you're looking at replacing a lot of the equipment, are you, because you and I had a conversation, I don't know, over a year ago about um, having more uh, equipment for children with disabilities. Is that, are you, do you have that in mind as you look at the plaza and also at Ramsey Park and other parks in general as you replace the equipment? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, I think I think we currently have an understanding that a lot of our places, spaces, and play equipment are, are currently not ADA accessible to, to begin with. I mean, even before we get to to kind of talks of of you know inclusive playgrounds or all inclusive playgrounds. So so as we move forward with any of our park park projects, I mean, we're we're, we're definitely required by law, but we are we're also very um, I think cognizant of, of of making sure that that is a priority as as we build um, new spaces out. Um, in terms of Ramsey Park, um, that you know, I, I think we've heard from from multiple individual individuals throughout this process that that there'd be strong preference to to make sure that that park uh, or that, that playground here is is all inclusive, and uh, what we're what we're doing is is kind of working with our consultants to to, to figure out okay what would what, what does that mean and how can we make this this become a reality so the the price tag that you'll see on on the slide that I presented tonight 
um, is really just for a regular type playground. But what I'm working with them as we move to final draft form is is to to have kind of an option to upgrade that playground to an all inclusive type playground, kind of similar to what you see with the magical bridge playgrounds over the hill, or what what the new Leo's um, um, Haven playground will be in Live Oak. Uh, because, because I, I mean, for me, that that's that's a huge priority as well. I mean, I, I would really like to see us move in that direction, and and figure out how to how to fund that so that it is accessible for all. In terms of of, of the plaza, um, again, it's 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 not going to be. I mean, if if we move forward with the design um, with a, with a play area included, um, it's really not big enough to to have or, or or have something that's that's kind of significant in terms of of, of size and, and scope. Um, but the idea would definitely be that it is ADA accessible and, and meets, meets those standards at, at a very minimum. Have you, um, just one more question, have you reached out to the San Andreas Regional Center that works really closely uh, with uh, children and adults with disabilities just to get an idea of what their needs are and how to engage the, those families so the kids can have more access to outdoor activities? I, I definitely have. We've been in conversation over, over, over the past year. We've been trying to get a meeting together, but um, for, some, for one reason or another, <laughs> we've been kind of thwarted with that effort. But um, I definitely need to reach, out, reach back out again to kind of um, reschedule and sit back down with, with them. I really would like to see that happen. Thank you. Commissioner Comer. You're just going to go down this way. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for that presentation. And, uh, both parks serve a large number of families and uh, kids, so I, the improvements are phenomenal and much needed in the community. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, for Ramsey Park, for for example, the um, making a, par a playground more accessible, and also maybe for the dog park, are there opportunities for for those groups of people to maybe do some fundraising or get grants or that kind of thing? Is that? Definitely. Um, y you know, w one of the other reasons why we're going through this process now, um, or, or just, you know, in, in general, is, is, you know, not just to position these projects for, for grant opportunities, uh, but also to be able to, to, you know, better kind of figure out what our vision is, figure out what those costs will be so that we can, um, you know, help facilitate you know, members of the community that, that want to kind of individually fundraise or, or you know, kind of search out private funding and, and, and whatnot. You know, I think what, what my goal with all of this is really to figure out, okay, what, what, what's our ask and how much does that cost so that um, we really can kind of take advantage of those types of opportunities where there's, where there's kind of community backing and excitement around helping to, to find the funds to, to make it happen. Oh, that's in one more question. Um, the Ramsey Park, in order to access that park for most of District 5, uh, we've talked about this already. Um, the pedestrian access, it means crossing over 152. And so I just want to put it out there. It would be really nice to have safer crosswalks um, on Pennsylvania there somewhere um, so that kids coming from District 5 can cross over to the skate park or to you know any of the playgrounds, the soccer field, any of those things. I, I, it's... I think that should be a high priority, being that there are no parks in, fifth, in the 5th District at all. Um, so making that crossing safe it is kind of, I think, a high priority to make it accessible to a lot of the, the people around the area, the families. So I don't know if that's in the yeah, plan. but <laughs> That's great feedback. Thank you. Um, in, in relation to the soccer fields, I, you mentioned that with the softball field that you're looking at maybe doing artificial turf on the softball field so that it can be used for soccer potentially when it's not being used for softball. Are the full-size fields also going to be considered for artificial turf? Um, we're looking at, at sticking with natural turf on the full-size soccer fields um, simply for the fact that, that you know, most of the field it lies within the 100-year floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, and when you go synthetic, it's, it's an additional, you know, kind of about like one to two million dollar investment. And so um, we've, we've kind of scratched the idea of, of going synthetic on those fields and, and concentrating, you know, kind of efforts to go synthetic on the softball slash soccer field. 
And then also on the soccer field, um, you mentioned that it has limited use because it lacks lights. Are there lights? There, in there are not lights on the existing soccer field currently. Um, so, so that's one limitation that we have um, in, in terms of obviously daylight hours. Um, the other big limitation that we have is, is the, 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 the field drains really, really poorly. And so it basically just everything, all the water that, that lands on the park kind of just all flows to the soccer field. Right. <laughs> so um, this plan would help address that as well, which would also increase the, the use of that, that field throughout the year. Okay, thank you. I have a few questions. Um, and also just thank you for a very comprehensive presentation. And um, I am super excited about both of these um, improvement projects. So what's the timeline for them? And how, what does the next steps look like? Yeah, so I, I'll start first by talking about kind of what we definitely know is is happening. Um, so, with with Ramsey Park, um, we we recently renovated the the restroom facility that's on on this side of the park. Um, we are wrapping up a renovation of the, of these restrooms back here. Um, the next couple things that are that I think are, are will likely kind of hit next are kind of some low hanging fruit. Um, projects here, so the Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz, um, mm -hmm. they're a nonprofit organization that, that has worked with the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz. Um, they have, have proposed to fundraise and to build and, and maintain um, our, our pump track back here. So we're working with the city attorney and 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 with them to to kind of figure out how we make that a reality. Um, so so that's something that that, that I, I kind of foresee happening, you know, within the next few years or so. Um, the, one of the other Prop 68 grant opportunities that we have coming right down the line in the next few months is, is what they're calling the per capita fund. And what that is is that basically every jurisdiction in California that has a parks and recreation agency will be given a certain amount of money um, based on, on, on population size. So we're, we're anticipating that, that Watsonville will get somewhere about $200,000 to $250,000, which isn't a ton of money, but it gets us most of the way to um, the build out of, of um, the dog park here. Um, so that combined with some of our park development funds could be, um, I think, I think a huge next potential step for, for Ramsey Park. Um, as I mentioned, with, with the rest of the, the facilities and the, the amenities in Ramsey Park, um, they come with kind of a, a higher price tag. And so, so we'd be looking at grant funding and private funding and, and you know, kind of fundraising and, and, that, and that sort of thing. Um, one of the challenges with, with Ramsey Park is that um, kind of some of the larger grant opportunities through 68 require that park spaces um, be within a half mile radius of, of um, kind of spaces that are that are low density in terms of a park space. So, so basically meaning that they have less than um, three acres of park space per thousand people um, within that half mile radius around the, the park. And that they also um, um, serve disadvantaged or, or actually are located in, in disadvantaged communities. And so they look at income levels of the half mile radius around the park as well. And um, you know, because Ramsey Park is so big, it doesn't qualify under the, the park um, kind of acreage um, qualifier. And, and also because of its location um, kind of sandwiched between a disadvantaged community and a not so disadvantaged community, it kind of knocks it out of the, the running um, for, um, for, for that qualifier as well. So um, that's one challenge we have. That's not to say that there aren't other opportunities. So, so we'll continue to look at those. Um, for the plaza, uh, we do have funding that's, that, that we've allocated for the permanent restroom, so that's going to be something that we'll be working on over, over the next year and will definitely be happening. And then um, uh, August 5th is actually when um, the first um, application process for um, kind of a larger part of money, part of money through Prop 68 is, is due, so we'll be, um, or our, we're anticipating applying for the plaza with whatever um, kind of our final design shape up to be after we meet with the council um, next week. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just have maybe not a question, just a question in general. With regards to the plaza, you referred to it as the community heart. Uh, I was born and raised in Watsonville um, in ag, dad also in ag. And we still have a uh, family. Well, my dad goes to the plaza to meet with friends at times, right? Um, and you referred to the city, you said something about the drop-in meetings, and you said 20. I'm not quite sure that 20 number. Can you go back to that?
So the workshop. Uh, you have um, stakeholder meetings at 39, uh, Ramsey Park workshops 48, which refer to Ramsey Park, I take it. What can you, can you give me more insight to that? Yeah, sure. So um, the, the first four set of meetings that are listed there in terms of our stakeholder meetings and our, our interactive workshops, we touched on, on all three of our projects. So the master plans at, at, the, at the plaza and, and Ramsey Park, as well as our overall strategic plan. Um, so, so with all of those meetings, you know, we, we, we sat down with, with individuals that came and, and as, as you can see in the picture here, kind of had large layout maps and whatnot of, of all of those spaces um, and spent time talking about, um, you know, the, the plaza along with, uh, along with the, other, the other two projects. When it came down to kind of the city plaza and the Ramsey workshops, we really kind of drilled down into specifically those, those two um, um, specific projects. Spent a little bit of time talking about the strategic plan, but really kind of focused more on the plaza and, and Ramsey. Um, following those meetings, um, we had several pop-up meetings. Um, the numbers look, look a little bit kind of skewed low um, in the number of people that we talked to there. Um, what, what that really represents is, is people who actually sat down with us and, and were willing to fill out surveys. It, those numbers don't capture you know, the number of people that came through and, and we spoke with at our booths and provided input on, on the maps that we had um, displayed at, 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 at those two meetings. Um, like I mentioned also, uh, we spent uh, quite a few Fridays at, at the farmer's market tabling and um, while we were there also um, sent, sent our teammates out into the plaza to talk with individuals, you know, kind of sitting on benches and, and just hanging out at the plaza as, as well. So again, you're referring to 20 individual people? Um, for the, the city plaza, um, the kind of specific workshop that we had, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, a, few, a couple of years ago, there was a committee that um, I, I was raising funds for the soccer field. Is that still happening? Have they been able to raise any funds? Yeah, so I, th I think that's in reference to our, our friends of Parks and Community Services. Right. Um, mm -hmm. They're still definitely an active group, and they're actually the group that has, is organizing our Strawberry Jam Fun Run on, on August 3rd. Um, I think that they, they haven't been as successful as, as I think they, they'd hope to, to have been by this point in terms of raising funds for capital projects. Um, they have a little bit of money in the bank to, to help support um, you know, things like the build-out build out of, of soccer fields and our other projects. Um, but it's 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 a pretty small amount of money so far. What they have been able to do over the past few years is is um, successfully fund a lot of um, scholarships for our recreation programs. So they'll fund um, you know things like 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 uh, youth to participate in in soccer programs and swim lessons and and art classes and and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. I think that in concludes our discussion. Thank you. So we're moving on to the agenda. Um, all right. I'm going to open it up to the public to make any um, comments if you'd like to speak to the parks um, presentation. It's a little bit out of order, but I also realize that some of you may be here for that. So if you'd like to, come on down to the podium and please um, give your name and um, fill out a card so that we can accurately reflect you in the minutes. Thank you. A 76-year uh, uh, resident of the city of Watsonville. Uh, and a uh, member of the uh, Paro Valley Historical Association as a volunteer. And uh, like everyone here, I uh, am absolutely uh, thrilled at, over some of the suggestions that Nick has come up with for improvements to our city. I think some of them are absolutely fantastic. However, I am forced to tell you that uh, the Paro Valley Historical Association has uh, joined together and with the entire board has signed uh, a dissent on the plans that are currently before us for the plaza and unfortunately we haven't been included in the process we haven't been invited to your pop-ups 
and uh, we haven't been able to get uh, input in. And uh, some of the questions we have, and I realize my three minutes doesn't allow a back and forth, but some of the questions we have is what historical significance is your project going to emote uh, the architecture, the bandstand that you call a gazebo, uh, and the history is glossed over, and probably because you're not a native and you don't understand its significance or importance. The uh, Para Valley Historic Association uh, also has community, uh, is community driven, and, and we, we only exist by the monies given to us by private parties. And so, uh, you know, we are sensitive to their opinions, which they are very loud about. And uh, I'm holding here over 250 petitions, uh, signatures on petitions, and we only got the petition started about a week ago uh, with volunteers wanting to go down to Knob Hill and Safeway and start uh, active uh, uh, petitioning of the community. We, we feel that, uh, the, that the historical value of the park uh, and the plaza is being confused by calling it a park. Uh, on, while we have 26 parks in the city of Watsonville, or 143 acres, a historic plaza uh, is uh, very rare. And if you travel around the world and, and you go to different communities around the world, Rome, the Trevi Fountain, the Colosseum, all of these are distinguished historical monuments. Uh, when we look back at our park, our plaza, we find that, you know, Don Sebastian went, went all the way back to the Spanish land grant era, and it, uh, it was a communication focal point for 29 cultures here in the Paro Valley. You know, you have to think about that. 29 cultures, people who could not speak and uh, communicate with each other, met in the park, sat at a bench, and I guess I'm over time. But uh, the point is, Par Valley Historic Association really feels we need to be involved in the discussion. Thank you for your comment. I will say that I do know that those meetings were open to the public and that many members of the public did attend them and that they were well advertised throughout the city. Any other members of the public? Good evening, members of the board. Uh, I'm here also. The main person I'm here is because I'm in opposition of any change to, the, to that park, to that plaza, any kind of. It's a, kind of a sacred cow. But anyway, I, I am Alex Alano. I've lived here since 1941. I've been in Wasserville 80 years. I've been through a, a local schools. I've been on a school board for eight years. I've been a Pistol Association board member for eight years. I always, uh, 18 years ago, I was standing here before, not you, but another group. There were politicians who were trying to make a change. We, we, we want that plaza to be in the plaza, Dolores Huerta. I don't know if you remember that or not. I did. And I, we filled this room. If you make a change to that plaza, we will be here. I know you don't have a lot of people to your meeting, but I guarantee you, uh, we will sh fill this room. I'll guarantee you that. So anyway, uh, I'm asking you to really consider no changes to it. I would like to see, though, uh, that bathroom. Uh, we need a bathroom. You know, you see people you know, going around the trees, you know, the kids. And we need to really, if you want to put the money in, maybe we won't have it, we can get it. But I like to see that plaza, the bandstand, you know, put it back the way it was. You can do it. It's all wood. But, and we can put it back together. There's people that can do it. They can do it. And I think we can get the people behind this. But I need your support. If you're any kind of a native here, you know that that park is very important. But she, uh, tonight, all these Mexican people, all these farm workers, you know, they, they spend the night there in the evening, you know. And, we, and that's what it was for. It was for all, but I wanted, but I don't want you to know that it was, it was meant to be for all cultures. I don't care what you are. That's what it's for. And that's what I'm asking you for. I'm sorry, I, I got emotional. <laughs> I got emotional. Uh, it's kind of a, 
uh, kind of a sacred place. But I, I, I speak about that. I've been here for a long time. So I'm asking you really for your support. I uh, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, my name is Susan Jacobs, and I too am at the Paro Valley Historical Association. And I want to tell you what the park means to us, what the plaza means to us, is we got, our city got wrecked. And that's kind of like the focal point that's still here. And I know that people say that maybe we can move the bandstand, but I spoke the other day to the Oliver sisters who have the, um, the big home, what is it? The Tuttle the House Tuttle Mansion. Mansion. And they told us it had cost them an absolute fortune to replace the stones on the front of the Tuttle. Do you know which one I'm talking about? It's the Red yes, House. Yes, Lake. And, okay, you listen to them. And <laughs> we have people calling us up and wanting to know about the cannons. I go down to the park. They tell me to stick my hand in the cannon. The big one, you can't stick your hand in the cannon because there's a plug. Does anyone know that? I know that. They told me that I could get a, a number. Couldn't do it. Because they wanted to tell us exactly all about this. It's, it's really interesting. I, I liked concept. It's the one that we, the third thing that you came up with, it was not on the website today but you'll get it up there <laughs> and we can take a look. And really, uh, we worked with Sariel for the 150th anniversary. We didn't find out about this. Because don't, I can tell you, we would have attended a lot of these meetings because we, I have five folders on the plaza itself, five. And you were showing the glass roof one. Did you know it was a glass roof? Yeah, if we, I mean, I will, I'm really just ticked that we just didn't have any input soon enough. And the other thing is, do we have enough money with this grants? We can do all of this, but can the city maintain it? It's not maintained too neatly now. But you keep it, you'll be in touch with us, I'm sure. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Seeing no other comments, I think I'll close the discussion. Thank you. All right, now we're moving on to the consent agenda. Um, we have two months worth of meetings to approve the minutes. Um, are there any changes that commissioners would like requested? Yes. Um, I have one change for the um, minutes for May. It's item or number four, appropriate motions. Um, it, it should read, Commissioner Kammer supports the 20% cap for business businesses with alcohol licenses, but thinks that it that an, sorry, that thinks that any increase not already grandfathered in should be looked on by, looked at on a case by case basis. You want me to repeat? Do you want me to repeat it or no? It's got it. Okay, thank you. Any other changes? Okay, is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion. Thank you. Second? I'll second it. Thank you. All for a vote. Is this just for me? Uh, we did it for both just now. So I have to abstain from one. 
Okay. Right. Uh, you're more than welcome to abstain, but uh, approving the minutes does not indicate that you're affirming that you were present and uh, are witness to them. It just means that you do not object to them and you're authorizing the um, clerk of the board to file them. So if that, if, if your concern is, this is a recurring concern of members of boards that they're worried that, about that, but it's perfectly okay to approve the minutes even though you weren't physically present. I'll do roll call. Acosta? Kammer? Yes. Sarmiento? Yes. Jones? Yes. Beach Olson? Yes. The motion passed. Okay, and moving on to our public hearing this evening. Um, this is a recommendation to the City Council for a general plan map amendment, <coughs> zoning map amendment, lot consolidation, special use permit with design review and environmental review for the construction of an 11,000 square foot medical office building at 5 Nielsen and 58 Hangar Way, filed by David Kim with Meridian Property Company applicant on behalf of Adolfo Garcia Nava, property owner. I believe we're going to start with a staff report this evening. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Ivan Carmona, Associate Planner for the City of Watsonville, and tonight I'll be presenting the dialysis clinic located on the corner of Nelson and Hangar Way. I will be discussing briefly the background, process, proposed project, discussion, environmental review, and the findings for the project. The applicant is requesting entitlements for a general plan map amendment, zoning map amendment, law consolidation, and a special use permit with design review and environmental review. The applications have been combined for the Planning Commission's review and recommendation to the City Council. The proposed project involves the construction of a single story, 11,273 square foot medical office building on the subject site. The property's building exterior is rectangular in shape, 84 feet in width, 137 feet in length, and 22 feet high. The proposed building's interior consists of a 10,956 square foot medical office area, 321 square foot storage receiving area, and six bathrooms totaling 526 square feet. The project also includes the following. Landscape that covers approximately 16% of the site, paving for the driveway and parking area totaling approximately 54% of the site, 49 parking spaces, including four accessible stalls, a 12 foot by 24 foot loading zone, and a trash enclosure. The proposed medical office will provide 24 hemodialysis treatment stations and two parental neal dialysis treatment rooms. Dialysis patients will receive treatments between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Most patients receive treatments three times per week for an average of four hours per treatment. As such, patients are typically scheduled to arrive Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, or Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays. According to the applicant, approximately a third of the patients would be transported to and from the site by transportation companies in wheelchair compatible vehicles. A third would have family drop them off and pick them up, and a third would drive themselves. Patient arrivals are staggered typically every 15 minutes to avoid overwhelming staff. The applicant indicates that the dialysis clinic would provide approximately 15 to 20 full-time jobs with a few part-time employees for a total of 30 new jobs at full capacity. Employees would arrive at approximately 5 a.m. and depart by 11 p.m. <coughs> Two adjoining properties under single ownership comprise the subject site. The one acre site is designated industrial on the general plan land use diagram and is within the industrial park zoning district located on the southwest corner of nelson street and hangar way the site is unimproved vacant land surrounded by light industrial and medical development 
The Wantsville Community Hospital is next to the site at 75 Nelson Street. The existing designation on the general plan land use diagram for the site is industrial and the zoning designation is industrial park. The adjoining hospital property at 75 Nelson Street, however, is designated public, quasi-public on the general plan land use diagram and institutional on the zoning map. The general plan allows hospitals on lands designated public, quasi-public, and medical clinics are conditionally permitted within the institutional zoning district. Granting the general plan and zoning designations will allow the site to be used as a medical clinic and thereby complement the Wantsmo Community Hospital by providing supplemental outpatient medical services to the community. The plot plan shows the existing and proposed property boundaries. As shown on this plan, the existing property boundary cuts across the proposed building, necessitating a lot consolidation, merging the two continuous parcels into one parcel prior to issuance of a building permit. A preliminary title report prepared by First American Title Insurance Company confirms that the two lots are owned by Mr. Adolfo Garcia Nava and Ms. Monica Mejia Gomez. The proposed project is consistent with the following general plan goals, policies, and implementation measures concerning land use compatibility, public land uses, and local employment. The site is a vacant lot within the city limit bordered on one side by a medical use, the Wattsville Community Hospital. The site abuts existing utilities that can be extended to serve the project. The project site is also in an urbanized area which is best suited for medical clinics because it is considered an urban use. The proposed project involves the construction of a new dialysis clinic that would provide medical services for the residents of Watsonville and surrounding communities. The project would create new employment opportunities, approximately 30 employees, of which 15 to 20 would be full-time. Medical clinics and rehabilitation facilities are permitted conditionally in the institutional zoning district with approval of a special use permit and design review. The project proposes to provide 49 parking spaces consisting of 35 standard stalls, 10 compact stalls, and four accessible stalls. The proposed number of parking spaces is consistent with the city's minimum parking requirement for the proposed use. The parking standard for a clinic is one space per 200 square feet of area. Uh, Once municipal code section 14-17.1001 subsection G. In accordance with the another section of the code 14-17.108, the floor area may be calculated at 85% of the building's gross floor area for the purposes of determining the number of parking spaces. Therefore, total parking spaces required for the 11,273 square feet building is 48 spaces and 49 are provided. The proposed project includes two driveway access points, one off Nelson Street and the other off Hanger Way. The internal circulation has drive aisles of at least 24 feet in width to conform the city's standards for back off space from a parking stall. In addition, the proposed driveway approaches are 24 and 26 feet wide. In accordance with a comment by engineering staff, the project has been conditioned to reduce the driveway width to the minimum fire lane width of 20 feet for the purpose of reducing the amount of impervious surface area. The minimum front yard setbacks for the institutional zoning district is 10 feet, pursuant to Watson Municipal Code Section 14-16.801. As shown on the site plan, the proposed building setbacks are 28 feet from Nelson Street and 14 feet from Hanger Way. The proposed setbacks are also appropriate for the project site setting in that they are consistent with the front and exterior side yard setback requirements for the Institutional Park Zoning District and therefore reflect existing building setbacks along Hanger Way. The Institutional Zoning District does not have a specified maximum building height for a medical clinic. As such, the proposed building height is analyzed in relation to the project site setting. The proposed building height of 22 feet is appropriate for the site in that it does not exceed the maximum building height of 35 feet for other buildings along Hanger Way in the Industrial Park Zoning District. The proposed building has a modern design. Proposed materials and additional architectural detailing for visual interest include articulated wall planes in three color schemes and a fiber cement wall panel system with vintage wood panels to frame the entrance. 
As shown in the slide, the entrance would also have illuminated panels with a blue finish. Windows proposed on all four sides of the building with either clear or frosted glazing. Metal canopies with a clear atomized finish extend over the proposed windows on the west and south elevations, facing the parking lot and internal drive aisles. The proposed building also includes a parapet wall to screen mechanical equipment on the roof from public view. The proposed project provides landscaping in the front, side, and rear yard areas and within the parking lot totaling 7,177 square feet or 16% of the site. The proposed planting plan provides a preliminary plant list and depicts the location of trees, shrubs, ground cover, and grasses. The proposed planting plan includes an appropriate mix of drought tolerant species suitable for the Central Coast region. The front of the building facing the street would exhibit a wide variety of plantings, including a number of different trees, shrubs, ground covers, and grasses. Many of these same plant species, but in different proportions, are proposed for the side and rear yard areas. The parking lot is broken up with landscape planters and shade trees every six stalls. The proposed planting next to the trash enclosure would soften its appearance and help screen it from public view. A project condition of approval requires the applicant to submit a final landscape and irrigation plan for review and approval by the community development director prior to issuance of a building permit. The proposed project is considered a post-construction requirement tier four type project as it would create over 22,500 square feet of new impervious services to the project site and therefore is subject to the compliance with the, before, with the performance requirements of the post-construction requirements tier four. The plan set includes a grading and drainage plan, storm drain plan, utility plan, stormwater control plan, and proposed features to reduce impervious surface services and stormwater runoff include the following. Vegetative swale in the landscape area in between the sidewalk along Nelson Street and the north side of the medical clinic. Vegetative swale in the landscape area bordering the south side of the medical clinic in between the internal pedestrian walk and the driveway access off a of hangar way. Vegetative swale along the south property line next to the trash enclosure. Engineering staff reviewed the proposed stormwater management plan and found them to be consistent with performance requirements post-construction tier four. A category exemption has been prepared for the construction of a medical office building on a one acre vacant property in an urbanized area because it can be seen with certainty that there is no possibility that the project would ha have a significant effect on the environment. In addition, this project is eligible for a class three category exemption pursuant to section 15303 of the state SUICA guidelines as the project involves the construction of a structure on a site in an urbanized area where all necessary public services and facilities are available and the surrounding area is not environmentally sensitive. With that, the Planning Commission may make the required findings in support of the project regarding the general plan map amendment, the zoning map amendment, law consolidation, special use permit, design review, and those findings were attached as exhibits A, B, C, and D to the resolution. With that said, uh, staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt the resolution recommending that the City Council approve the project as conditioned. This concludes staff's report. Do the commissioners have any questions? Um, so this lot is currently zoned industrial or industrial IP? Yes, okay. that is correct. And, and we're recommending that it change to? That it be zoned to um, institutional with the general plan land use designation of public, quasi-public. Okay, okay. So from industrial to institutional. Okay, all right. And then... Um, I had a question on the, the parking. 54% is obviously over half of the land area. Is, I mean, I read about the, um, the engineers approving with that, um, the drainage, but 54% seems like a lot of the area to be 
paved over with impervious surface. Is that, can that be, well, I don't know if, <laughs> can that be changed? I don't know how to ask that. Do I ask that of you? Do I, who do I ask that of? Is, is that a possibility? <laughs> well, <coughs> part of the reason why there's this amount of parking is not only what the applicant proposes to ensure they have adequate parking, but also it reflects the city's minimum parking standards. And uh, as Ivan noted, they've already taken into account a 15% reduction based off of using only 85% of the gross as opposed to 100% of the gross floor area. So we've already required less parking than what our minimum standard of two, one per 200 per square foot. To allow them to further reduce it, they would have to formally request a variance from the city's parking standards okay. to go beyond that. I will say that their parking study, yeah. the traffic study includes a parking component that substantiates that that might be appropriate because a portion of the clientele will arrive by transit or be dropped off by uh, family members and maybe only a third will drive their own individual cars to and from the site. So the parking for the patients as well as the employees should result in a parking demand on a typical day of only 29 spaces. Okay, yeah, that's what I, okay. And so y I think you're right to question whether or not we need all these spaces, but that's not what's been proposed or requested. Okay. In, in the form of a variance, I should say. Is there a possibility of not using impervious surface for the entire parking area? It that is an option. So when an engineer designs a drainage plan, there's different ways that they can comply with the city's stormwater requirements. One of which is to, per, for example, do what they've done here, and that do a series of infiltration basins throughout the site in bioswales. That's one way of accommodating everything from treatment to peak flow management. They can also do things like propose um, pervious pavers, and sometimes you'll see sites, and we've seen this in other projects, where portions of parking areas or driveways are made with pervious pavers. That reduces the overall impervious surface area and therefore has the added benefit of smaller or no need for detention basins like what's being proposed here. On more constrained sites, sometimes they even go underground into chambers. Okay, and that was the, okay, that, that was like the uh, high school that was what they chose to do in the high school site because okay. they didn't have room on the surface to do the other two options. Okay, all right. I, I guess I, in this day and age, I, I, and with the limitations and, and the concern about environment, it, that, that was a red flag for me. But, um, and then uh, just out of curiosity, it, is there a reason it's a one-story building? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can it be a two-story building and have a smaller footprint? <laughs> I think I would have to defer that to <laughs> the applicant yeah. of you know, the type of layout that they're looking for. Um, but I think he would be a better person to answer that question. Thank you. May I? Great. Yeah. So back to the parking. Um, we refer to 49 parking spaces, standard, and then we have 35 standard, 10 uh, stalls, and then four accessible right um, and you referred to vehicles that are going to drop people off right I don't I'm looking at this and I've looked at it a few times and I'm not maybe I'm not understanding it so I need your help to explain it to me <laughs> so I'm looking at this I'm trying to figure out accessible it looks like they're in the main area right the front area is that what you refer to as accessible and and That's again correct. be mindful that we have vehicles that are dropping people off on a regular basis right correct okay and part two is we have people that are also arriving for long periods of time, not just for a few minutes, right? Correct. Um, have we thought about people that may be dropping somebody off that may have an electric vehicle that may want to charge? You have? Well, actually, the building code, when they do submit for a building permit, that's the time we can have them request and put in future electric vehicle charger stations. And again, That's this part is of just the, a question, okay? Correct. So just, yeah. So part of this planning and entitlement, we don't review or we don't suggest ideas because we're not the designers, we're not right. the engineers, but at the time of the building permit submittal, the sure. building code, it will look at that aspect as far as parking and providing right. um, 
charging and stations in the parking lot. And again, I only bring this up because of the amount of period of time that they're going to be there. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So with the, again, going back to the, the vans or whatever may be dropping off, the accessibility to the facility itself, can you explain to me where the parking Yeah, there's a loading at? dock. If you look at this slide here, right over here where I'm pointing with the mouse, mm -hmm. this is the drop-off area. Okay for their service vehicles, specifically people in wheelchairs okay. who will be dropped off at this location. Okay. All right. Any other clarifying questions? <coughs> okay, seeing none, I think we'll invite the applicants for their presentation. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. Uh, my name is Mike Kahn. I'm the Executive Vice President with Meridian Property Company. We are a West Coast-based healthcare owner and operator of real estate. Some of our major clients that we've worked with in the past include Kaiser Permanente, Stanford Healthcare, UCSF, and DeVita Dialysis. Um, my colleagues, Indrajit Obeseker and Jackie Welge are here with me to assist if needed if there are questions. So we initially submitted this application. Thank you, sir. Just a resemblant uh, building um, of a past dialysis project that we did um, in a different location. It's not resemblant of, of this particular project. I'll leave this up for now. Uh, as I was saying, we originally submitted this application in early 2017, and we worked really closely with staff to address their concerns at that time. Um, our completed application was, was submitted in the summer of 2017, but unfortunately due to larger political issues, including a California Senate bill, our project was put on hold. That legislation has since been shot down, and uh, we would like to commit to uh, moving this project forward at this time. Um, I will. Currently, there are approximately 66,000 patients in California who require frequent and regular dialysis treatment. Um, these patients require dialysis three times a week for approximately four hours per day for the rest of their lives. Uh, if they go off the treatment, uh, they would gain sepsis and, and they would have catastrophic effects. So this is a very important uh, treatment for the community of Watsonville and their citizens. The inability to access dialysis care due to missed appointments or delayed appointments will result in emergency department visits, which is a significant socioeconomic cost to taxpayers, hospitals, and the community. This really is a life-saving treatment that is needed. The proposed dialysis center will serve a large underserved community in Watsonville, and the Rural Health Research Study in 2012 concluded that end-stage renal care disease, or referred to as ESRD, disproportionately affected poor and minority individuals and that 22% of ESRD patients lived in rural America. Another study published in the Clinical Kidney Journal identified Hispanic communities as receiving far lower levels of critical pre-ESRD care than the general population. The dialysis center will be an important contributor to the battle against kidney disease in the city of Watsonville. Most likely all of us in this room either has a loved one or knows someone who's currently receiving dialysis or will be on it in the near future. It's unfortunately an epidemic that, that isn't going away, and we're pleased to provide facilities that address this concern. As stated in the staff report, the proposed dialysis center will be approximately 11,200 square feet and will be combined on a, a two-parcel, 1.15-acre site on a prominent corner of Hanger and Nielsen. The center will have 24 hemodialysis treatment stations and two peritoneal dialysis treatment rooms. The center may not operate at full capacity at the beginning. There is some, some ramp up time as patients are added to the new client roster. This will, as stated, create 15 to 20 full-time jobs, and these are good jobs um, for nurses, facility administrators, social workers, biomed technicians, um, with a few part-time jobs adding approximately 30, 30 jobs at this location. The center hours, as stated, are approximately 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Generally, you can think of it as running or shifts, 
6 a.m. to 10, 10 to 2, 2 to 6, and so on. Um, the late shift is important for members who want to live a normal life working, a normal you know, 9 to 5 type job, and they can receive their treatment in the evenings. Um, it is open only Monday through Saturday, generally closed on Sundays. And as stated, approximately a third of the patients uh, will be tran transported by transportation companies in wheelchair compatible vehicles. Another third are usually dropped off by loved ones who stay in the community and use the businesses, shopping, restaurants, and whatnot. So it does add some additional commerce to the community. And a third, about a third of them drive themselves. The parking, uh, as stated, is 49 to 50, sta 50 spaces as proposed, and that is calculated at 5 per thousand on 85 percent of the building gross. Um, I should mention there were some comments about the parking. Um, five per thousand is is the industry standard for healthcare. That's really what the medical providers want. Um, while it is true that we don't require that much for this site because we do have a lot of people dropped off, um, that is what we we propose. But um, if the impervious surface areas are a concern, we'd be happy to work with staff to introduce things like uh, permeable pavers, which would reduce our, our impervious footprint to the site. Um, another comment that was made um, about a one-story one versus two-story building, I'd like to address that real quick. Um, one story is really important. It has to do with patient safety and line of sight for the nurses. Uh, we have looked at doing two-story buildings in other projects, but it really just isn't in the patient's best interest. Additionally, we have uh, something in here called a reverse osmosis room, which is all the fancy equipment that provides the, uh, the systems that filter the blood. And when we've, we've experimented with having those on different levels, there's pressure drops and things like that that, that make things a little difficult. So, so one story is really the preferred option by our op operators. And then lastly, on kind of on the parking, there was some a question about um, electric car chargers. We'd be happy to work with staff to make provisions to make sure we, we provide electrical for that. You know, usually it's a level level two charger, you know, 220 volts, so that so that those things are there for people that, who want electric vehicles. Lastly, just on the parking, we do also also want to thank you know 15 to 20 years from now, this is proposed as a long-term lease. We want to be respectful of the the future use of the building, and you know this could be something else in the future if and when that operator ever moves out so we would like to provide enough parking to allow ourselves some flexibility later on okay this is an aerial of the general site plan and as stated in the staff report the proposed dialysis center requires a general plan general plan amendment zoning plan amendment lot consolidation with special use permit and design review the extension of the adjacent zoning and general plan designations from adjacent Washington Community Hospital site to the property is consistent with public policy and the goals of City of Watsonville zoning code and general plan. Uh, I would just like to just call your attention to the outline of the, the blue area is the hospital. What's not outlined is the parking that's right ad adjacent to the red area. It, it literally is adjacent. Um, we think this is a good complementary outpatient service. Um, it is consistent with the Affordable Care Act that was brought out where there's a push to, to make outpatient facilities more readily available to patients. That has to do with access to care and delivering it at a lower cost. I'm sure a lot of the political debates, you're going to hear a lot about that in the near future, but this is, this is exactly what they're talking about. We're trying to move those patients out of the hospital and provide better access to care. It also allows the nephrologists who who run these facilities to go back and forth to the hospital to do their rounds to treat patients. You can see from this slide that the proposed site use is synergistic with the large Watsonville community, hospital commu community immediately to the north. The property has been a vacant lot um, and underutilized for some time. In fact, I drove by it today and it, it is overgrown with weeds and it it really has the ability to be something special. It's a prominent corner lot, and we think we've proposed something very high quality that would be very nice for the city of Watsonville. It should be noted that last time when we submitted our application, we did, we did conduct a community outreach event at the site um, where we did hand deliver flyers and try to gain input from the community. We, we did not have any negative feedback to the proposed uh, project. This next slide is a, is a site plan, 
and as you can see, it has, it's proposing two, two points of access, making site circulation very easy. The proposed building fronts the corner of Nelson and Hanger, creating a strong present on both streets. Um, as staff mentioned, we set the building back further than is required by zoning to give a little bit of extra landscaping and, and um, greenery to the front, front streets there. Um, we will have an, more than enough parking based on the parking study. Uh, the dry vials meet the codes of the fire department. We, we are open to working with staff if they would like to reduce the dry vial slightly from what we've shown. The site will have adequate landscaping with low water use plantings and lots of shade trees as well. Next slide is uh, just a recap of the four building elevations. The building materials consist of a well thought out blend of materials and colors. The color palette has a lot of warm colors, lots of glass lines, and use of different panels, such as the fiber cement board Nietzsche Ha panels, three different tones of stucco, and decorative aluminum awnings. <clears throat> the con construction itself will have attractive accent reveals on the stucco, foam cornices near the top, a defined entry feature to give the building articulation and interest, and screen mechanical equipment on the roof. All four sides of the building, uh, have been accentuated with visual interest and features due to the building's prominent location on the corner of the two streets. We propose signage on all four building facade elevations, as you can see, and we wel welcome any feedback uh, from the planning commissioners on design that we can pass on to staff uh, during plan check and permitting. This project is an important addition to the city and community of Watsonville, and it will allow our operator to provide the very needed kidney care treatment dialysis services to Watsonville residents. Um, we are proposing an approximate $10 million investment in this site when it's all said and done. So it is a very significant investment in the city. The dialysis center will create a number of high paying jobs, healthcare jobs, as we said before, both during operation and during construction, architects, engineers, contractors, et cetera. And it will generate spillover economic benefits for the surrounding businesses by activating the street on a prominent corner next to the hospital. Our building is proposed, has quality finishes, and is architecturally compatible with the existing design themes in the neighborhood and will be pedestrian and environmentally friendly. Finally, um, the extension of the adjacent hospital zoning and general plan designations to the property and the project is consistent with public policy and the goals of the city of Watsonville's zoning code and general plan, as staff has stated in the staff report. We really appreciate your support for this very important project and I am available for any questions. Thank you very much. We'll open up to the planning commissioners for clarifying technical questions for the applicant. Um, I just wanted to find out if is this, is this the first dialysis clinic in Watsonville or does the hospital hospital operate one? I believe the hospital has a, a couple of dialysis stations within inside the actual hospital, but this would be the first for our operator that would be outside the hospital. There's um, um, one by the California Grill. I was going to mention. On Penny Lane. Okay. There's a couple of regional operators, one being Satellite Healthcare. Um, th There's a few. <laughs> and Fresenius and, and DeVita that are the usual suspects, and they have uh, different locations in and around the city. Correct. Okay. And also, will you have um, something like urgent care rather than people going to the emergency, um, you know, a clinic, or how will that work? if somebody's not a regular patient? Uh, great question. Uh, this is not proposed as an urgent care facility. There would be no walk-ins. It's generally by appointment only. Once you're on dialysis, it's, it's a schedule. You either go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So there would not be anybody driving in to receive treatment. They would go to another urgent care facility or to the emergency room. And lastly, uh, are you planning on using any solar panels besides the, I think the charge station would be great, but anything that is green technology that you'll be using in any way possible? Uh, gr great question as well. So uh, the California Building Code already basically gets you to lead silver if you use all the green building code. We commission all of our mechanical electrical systems. We're open to the car chargers. 
On this project, we're not proposing photovoltaic panels on the roof. Um, primary reason for that is uh, we have a lot of mechanical equipment on the roof with HEPA filtration, and it ha there are certain rules that state you can't have certain units within a number of feet from the other ones for air intake purposes. So they're spread out all over the place, and it makes a really inefficient layout. Um, on past projects, we have upgraded the glazing systems to thermochromic glass, which provides a natural tinting effect. So we do experiment with things like that um, that are energy efficient, and we're always looking for to incorporate things like that. So great question. It, it would be possible to, to be certified as a green business here in the community, and those are mm -hmm. steps that you know any business takes towards being more environmentally sustainable and friendly. Yeah, the, uh, any, any building, I think, in California over 10,000 square feet is required to go through a green building certification. And basically what that means is the engineers design the mechanical and electrical systems, and then you go through a process that usually costs between twenty-five dollars and $50,000 to actually commission it and certify that what was designed actually got installed and is actually functioning as it was designed. So that's, that's a process we go through at the end of the project on every building. Thank you. Extra step we take. Uh, one question, how, uh, approximately how many patients are in the Watsonville area, do you estimate? I probably shouldn't comment directly on that because I'm not the actual operator, but I will say the operators do receive uh, end-stage renal care reports of who's in stage three or stage four, and that the, it anticipates who will need the treatment in the next two to three years, because it generally takes that long of a cycle to get a facility like this up and running. Um, generally, it takes us about a year to construct the building, and it can take almost a year after that to get it licensed with the state. Um, lots of people are trying to streamline that to get the services quicker, but um, there is enough demand, um, our operator thinks, to justify um, a full-size clinic, which is what this is. It's 24 stations, and you can multiply that by three or four shifts, so you could get anywhere from 75 to 100 patients on the Monday, Wednesday, Friday cycle, and another 75 to 100 on the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday cycle. That kind of gives you an idea of the demand. Thank you. Any other questions from the commissioners? Okay, I'd like to open it up to the public for anyone who has any comments or would like to ask questions. Yeah, you, um, those who wish to make a comment can come on down to the podium, please. And be sure to give your name for the record. Thank you for inviting me to participate in the meeting tonight. Um, my name is Nomi Franklin, and I happen to be a property owner on Hangar Way, right around the corner from uh, the proposed site on Nielsen. And um, it's true that property has been empty for many, many years, and um, I think it would be great to have a structure on that corner. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm a, um, a minority woman-owned business for 35 years. I've been an employer in uh, Watsonville for 25 years, um, running an art textile business, a national-based business, um, and, um, you know, the reason why I'm here today is because I was interested to find out what was actually going to be possibly moving into the neighborhood. And I think that um, from my point of view, it would be a welcome improvement because it's been an empty lot. And um, I think it will improve property values. I think that it'll probably improve security in the neighborhood. And, um, and certainly it would be you know, opportunity to beautify the neighborhood as well. So, um, not sure if there was many more points that I wanted to make, but um, 
yeah, I think that's that's basically it. That I'm I'm in approval of the proposed development. Um, I think the neighborhood could use a boost, and um, and it looks like a beautiful building. So, I don't know if you have any questions or if not. Thank you for coming. Thanks yeah, for your comment. Yeah, I'm surprised that there aren't any other property owners in, in the audience tonight. You'd think they would all be interested. But anyways, <laughs> thank you. Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Victor Morani. I'm with the Wattsville Neighbors Association. And I want to echo the thoughts of Nomi Franklin, who's been in our community many years and helped uh, with all sorts of projects on Hangar Way. I know there's um, a lot of changes in the city, good changes, especially along the Hangar Way area. A lot of upgrades, a lot of projects you've recently uh, looked at and approved, and I think it's great. Um, kind of wanted to provide some public input. I think uh, you've already received public input about the necessity for dialysis treatments. Uh, the folks pointed out uh, Mr. Conn, in his presentation that uh, Wattsville is an underserved community, I can definitely say that's true. Um, we had a lot of uh, these projects got put on hold because of Proposition 8, you may remember, and of course uh, the city and county here voted overwhelmingly in support of the dialysis services for people because they know how critical it is. And to answer the other questions, yes, there are numerous people, uh, and maybe they don't live exactly in the city limits. They might live in La Selva or Aptos or Coralitos or whatever. But I want you to imagine having to have this done to live every day and a half. You have to go do this for four hours a day. And you have to get on Highway 1 and go north. Just kind of close your eyes and imagine what that's like. It's, it's a great inconvenience right now. Imagine if it was life-threatening. So. I'm encouraging you very strongly. This is a great location for that. It's right next to the hospital. Proximity is perfect. Um, and you save lives. My adopted uncle, Uncle Bob, had to go all the way to Santa Cruz. Um, he did drive an electric car, by the way. They didn't have a charging station. <laughs> uh, later, we had to drive him, and then he eventually passed away. But um, that drive north, it's, it's, it's literally a killer. And, and you have to be there at a certain time. If you miss your appointment, it's really bad. Um, I would put some flexibility in there about letting them open on Sundays, if necessary, for emergency purposes. Uh, some people miss appointments. There's a lot of people that want to visit relatives in the area, and they have to get dialysis from somewhere else, like down south, like in LA or Santa Barbara. They want to come up for the holidays. They have to make arrangements so they don't miss their, their spot. And so by having more availability, that's a really big thing. So I can't begin to encourage you how important this is, uh, how the public's already weighed in. You can look at the election results you want you know, online and see how they supported it. Um, and I just want to thank you for moving this along so quickly to the staff, because this is, this is something that's just critically important. Um, and yes, I'm like Nomi, I'm surprised there aren't more people here supporting this, because Maybe they just didn't know because it's been an empty lot for so long. <laughs> anyway, I strongly recommend, and I know there's many other people in the community, to pass this along as quickly as possible, and I have a feeling you probably will. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Good evening. I'm uh, Randy Parker, commercial real estate broker, and I'm, I'm here on behalf of um, Adolfo Garcia and Monica. Gomez, um, Adolfo and Monica aren't able to make it tonight. They're out of town on vacation. But a um, little bit about this. So they've owned the property for, for several years and at one time planned on occupying it, um, the land, to store their equipment for their business, the uh, community tree service. And uh, for a variety of reasons, they, they never occupied the land. So, you know, along the way, we kind of changed the direction and put the property back on the market for sale or a build-a-suit to accommodate a tenant for lease. And economically, we could never really get 
to uh, get an industrial project to, to pencil out with the cost of new development permits, architectural design fees, construction costs were never really in sync with uh, market rents. So recently, well, yeah, yeah, so recently again, so Meridian Property Development approached us again and we negotiated a purchase sale agreement and mutually executed it. And just want to say that, you know, ownership has found Meridian to be very professional in their dealings and quite capable of handling the development. So, yeah, we believe from our personal experience that a medical office building will make for an ex excellent addition to the, uh, to the neighborhood, especially true with the proximity to the hospital. We support the recommendation to allow the construction of the 11,273 square foot medical office building at the corner of Nielsen and Hangar Way. Thank you. Thank you Questions? for your comment. Thank you. I just want to thank all you that came out to speak this evening. Um, know me and Vic. Um, services are, they are critical to the community and surrounding communities. Um, as mentioned, you know, it will bring other people in from other communities that uh, will promote our city. Uh, so. Thank you. Seeing no further public comment, I think it's um, time for an appropriate motion. I'd like to make a motion that we recommend the project to the City Council for approval. I'll second. Okay, hearing a motion and a second, then we will open it up for deliberation among the commissioners. I have a question. How do we incorporate a recommendation for um, charging stations and maybe permeable surfaces? Can we, does that go in the motion or it's just kind of a something the Planning Commission said? How does that work? <laughs> The first one is the charging stations. I think that's a building code yeah. issue now. And I think when you have certain numbers of parking spaces or certain size buildings, I'm not sure which it is, there's a ratio uh, where I know, I think you, you're required to at least put conduit in and maybe actually have the charging stations. Staff probably knows better, than, they know better than I. To, to answer the question, yes, our zoning ordinance and, and city regulations do not talk about charging stations. That's the state regulations, that's the building code. So when they do submit for a building permit, we will have a chance to look at it and we can make that requirement at that time. I, th I think that's part of the building code. City follows the state building code, so it'll be implemented there. And the other item was? Well, the semi-permeable. Uh, or per permeable either. Um, I mean. Uh, I suppose this, you could give staff direction to work with the applicant or you could uh, seek to amend the approval and impose that as additional conditions. And I would defer to staff about how they wish to handle that. Yeah, I, I, I could just jump in there. They've, they've designed their um, post-water construction standards um, pretty thoroughly at this point, I think. Um, you know, it was probably designed based on the permeability of the soils um, at the site. I'm guessing that if they didn't choose permeable pavers, it's probably because the soil isn't really great at draining, and that's why they chose other ways to, to drain the site. That makes sense. And I, I would add in that uh, they, they do meet the city's ordinances. They, they satisfy our ordinances in whatever way they do it. So. Okay, thank you. Any further deliberation? Okay, seeing none, I believe we can call for a roll call vote. Okay, the motion is to uh, Approve staff's recommendation, and I'll do the roll call. Acosta? Yes. Kammer? Yes. 
Sarmiento? Yes. Jones? Yes. Beach Olson? Yes. The motion's passed. Motion passes. Thank you for attending tonight. And uh, then we move on to um, item B, which the applicant withdrew the appeal. So I believe we can move on to the report of the secretary. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. Not a whole lot to report tonight, although I don't think you guys have met our new planner, <coughs> our newest planner. Sarah Weichel. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> she came to check it out tonight, and I promised her it was going to be a quick meeting, and oh well. <laughs> Not as long as the last couple ones, so uh, we're getting shorter. Yeah, so she is um, an awesome addition to, to our planning team. So glad to have her. And she'll be up here presenting before we all know it. Um, <laughs> so thank you for coming. Put you on the spot. We will not be having our August meeting because it always falls on National Night Out. So hopefully you get out and attend um, a gathering in your neighborhood. And we will see you all after school starts again in September. So have a great rest of the summer. And uh, if I don't see you before, I'll see you in September. <laughs> <laughs> and this meeting is adjourned this evening. <laughs>